Good evening, everybody. We're about to start. Welcome to uh, today's uh, online cultural majlis. Just checking once again, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up if yes. Great, thank you. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to announce our speaker for today or present our speaker for today. Uh, in fact, our speaker for today has a gargantuan task because uh, we have tried to really uh, include these two major subjects in one hour. And I think that um, if any of you know the Middle East, you will know that each of these two subjects deserves at least an hour, if not hours, in order to be covered. Um, but I don't think I can think of anyone better than, uh, than our guest tonight, uh, who, by the way, has just uh, broken her fast. So I really appreciate her uh, being here tonight with us so, so soon after uh, she had her, uh, her meal. And I will uh, tell you how the hour will uh, progress. Uh, in the first 20 minutes, Dr. Adela is going to speak about uh, the Palestinian Museum, uh, an issue that is, I think, relevant not only to, to us here in the Middle East and the Arab world, but throughout the world as a, an important site of representation of a, a, a people uh, uh, who deserve much recognition. And uh, in the second 20 minutes, uh, Dr. Adela will attempt to speak about uh, her, her in-depth research on uh, modernist, Turkish-born modernist, Fakhr Nisa Zaid, uh, that she has researched and published a book about. Uh, and I will take your questions on the side, and we will try to give at least 20, 20, 25 minutes at least to your questions. So make sure that you add your affiliation and your full name so I can direct the question to Dr. Adela. I'll introduce her very fast because time is of the essence. Dr. Adela Laidi Haniya is a writer and academic and the Director General of the Palestinian Museum since 2018. Uh, Dr. Adela received her PhD in Cultural Studies from George Mason University uh, as a Fulbright Scholar and obtained an MA in the Arab Studies Program from Georgetown University. Uh, she also uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship from the Arab Council for Social Sciences and taught at Bir Zayt University in Palestine. Uh, she's published several books and essays, including one uh, on the uh, artist uh, of tonight's uh, subject, Fakhr Nisa Zaid, titled Painter of Inner World. Uh, and also she is the founding director of the Khalil Sakakini Cultural Center in Palestine, where she curated to much acclaim uh, an exhibition titled 100 Shaheed, uh, 100 Lives. Dr. Adela, uh, I will be going through the slides, uh, but I think uh, you, may, you may start whenever you like. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. Oh, well, and shukran kthir, Sultan. Uh, I know we have to speak in English. Um, thank you so much, Sultan, for inviting me to the new uh, Middle East public square that you have created. And thank you for giving culture, you know, a larger presence and also a larger value and a larger spotlight. I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you and uh, marhaba to everybody. Ramadan Mubarak, belated happy Easter. Thank you. So, yes. You have 20 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, I can start. Type. So we will start by speaking about the Palestinian Museum, which opened uh, four years ago. And it, it opened in Palestine, in Birzeit, in a small village town, becoming a town, university town, called Birzeit. So you can see the building here. You see it's flat, uh, elongated, horizontal. It, it was uh, designed by an Irish uh, firm called uh, Henehan Peng, who had the distinction and the great honor of winning for their work, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and that's the the square that you see on top. Uh, so we're very proud of uh, that uh, win. And the building is not only an architectural uh, gem, but it is also LEED certified. This is a, a certificate issued by the Council for uh, Green Buildings in the US, and we're the only building in, in Palestine to have received it, and the only museum in the Middle East. It's a shame that this is an old picture, but the garden is full of plants and flowers. It's blooming. We have plants and flowers uh, that are native to all of uh, Palestine. So hopefully, many Many of you will be able to visit us soon. Next slide, sorry. Okay, so uh, 
I can talk later in the questions about what is the museum and what is the museum, what is the museum about and its vision. But uh, I'd rather just, you know, s describe the the picture. So this slide is about the museum being a transnational museum above all. So, for example, the very first exhibition that opened at the museum did not open at the museum. It opened in Lebanon, in Dar en Nimer, in 2016, which was called at the seams, an absolutely beautiful exhibition curated by guest curator Rachel Dedman. We are also a transnational museum because of all our digital programming. So for example, you can visit now on our website, you can get a 360 tour of the first exhibition we had at the museum, the Jerusalem Lives exhibition. And if you wear your goggles, if you have cardboard goggles at home, you can also see it with 3D. And speaking of 3D, we developed a virtual reality version of our uh, Palestinian embroidery exhibition. And the, the marvelous picture that you see here at the, at the bottom is a lady who lives in Mukhayyam al-Jalil in uh, Lebanon, Palestinian lady, who is guided by a young volunteer from a library there. And she is experiencing the VR of the Palestinian embroidery exhibition. So this is just a small sample. We will get more, Hala. Five. So uh, we have the museum where we do all of the work, but we also have two major uh, digital platforms, two independent web websites, which I invite all of you to visit, and I, I, can, I can explain why. But let's begin with the first one. The first one is called PAL Journeys, and this is what you see on the website, PAL Journeys, Rihlat Palestinia Bel Arabi. This is a project in cooperation with uh, uh, IPS, Institute for Palestine Studies, and the initial design was elegantly uh, produced by Visualizing Palestine. Uh, so we salute our partners. This is uh, basically, um, an enormous source of information, which is accurate and in-depth information in Arabic and in English about the history of Palestine from, let's say, four centuries with basically scholarly type of documentation. So you have original documents, you have original photographs, there are thousands of photographs, you have chronologies, articles. So it's basically everything you ever wanted to know about Palestine, but were afraid to ask, is on paljourneys.org. But then the second website we have, that's a wonderful project uh, that we're very privileged to uh, have been working on for two years and hopefully, uh, no, actually for three years, and hopefully we, it will continue forever, basically. Uh, this is called the Digital Archive. So whereas in the first one, in paljourneys.org, we had the scholarly look at the history of Palestine, heavily documented by documents and dates and facts and history. This is history from below, palarchive.org. Palarchive.org, we just launched last year. So on the right, you have the, uh, the website. And on the left, we printed out some images and we blew them up and we put them in our hallway at the entrance of the museum in Birzeit. So why is it history from below? Because we uh, have a, a team of researchers who collect, who identify and who collect collections from anyone, like anybody who may be watching me now, who has family photos, um, uh, maybe some trade union documents, maybe some municipalities, uh, minutes, maybe some private letters of somebody who was significant in one way or the other. Basically, it's to document the uh, the resistance and the achievements of the Palestinian people from the 19th century until now through private normal everyday quotidian collections it's a treasure trove and everybody's invited not only to to participate to look but also if you see like uh, missing information th this is uh, you know this is participatory it's, it's open source you can write us and we will add the information so that's the first one was PAL Journeys, the second one was PAL Archive, and they're both growing and growing and growing, and we have surprises in store, and uh, uh, they're accessible in Arabic and in English. This, this, I want to speak briefly about our collection, at least what I can show of our collection. 
So uh, we start by the garden, the beautiful garden I showed you at the start. So for example, so we have a few artworks that are permanently installed. For, for example, we start with the work by uh, uh, Saudi artist Sultan bin Fahed at the top. And next to it, we have a work by the Palestinian artist Khalil Rabah. Uh, actually, there was another one, 67% and 48%, but I, I only showed this. So these are permanently installed in the garden. Uh, they were part of our first exhibition that I will discuss later. Uh, here we are very proud to have revived this uh, building, this uh, vernacular building craft, which you see on the top right, I think, of your screen, which is what we call a mentar or a watchtower, which is a sort of structures that farmers or, or um, yeah, used to build on their lands far away from the cities uh, to go during harvest time. So there was no transportation to go and sleep back home. So they would sleep on site and keep the harvest and the animals in the bottom. And actually many of them appear in the uh, paintings of Sliman. So why, of Sliman Mansour, the great artist Sliman Mansour. So why is this here? Because in our last uh, exhibition that just closed last year, we asked uh, Sliman to contribute a work to the garden. You know, so we thought he was going to create some work, you know, like the ones you see on the left. So he said, no, my work is that I want a mentar to be revived. And we had to look very hard to find a person who could actually build it. Uh, anyway, so that's part of our collection, the bottom, the, I mean, the, the top half. But then we have at the bottom half, we have on the right, uh, part of our remarkable collection of Palestinian political posters donated by Ambassador Ali Qazakh. And then on the left, we have the linkage between the digital programming I mentioned and the collection. This is my colleague, Bara, who is working in our lab. We're very proud of this lab. It's a conservation lab. And uh, this is a project in cooperation with the British Library, and it's funded by the British Council. And we uh, conserved and repaired 3,000 documents last year, and we will be repairing more uh, this year, and we will be actually opening it to the public so that they can bring their old documents. And you know how much, you know, paper documents are very important in Palestinian history to repair and to uh, also preserve. So that's part of our work in collections. It's very, but I want to mention that we do have other collections that are in the diaspora that we're trying to bring, and I'd rather not discuss them now. So here we see, for example, uh, one space of the museum, which is what we call the glass gallery. This is an outside, this is a, like a corridor that goes all along our main exhibition space. And we will be developing the space to use it as an exhibition, as a permanent exhibition space. But now, right before we did, we, we had to close down because of the COVID, we exhibited part of our posters collection in a brilliant uh, presentation curated by my colleague, Adele Jarrar. Oh, and actually, sorry, some of you may already know about this exhibition because as soon as we had the closure with the confinement, we released online a video version of it. Uh, we have three versions. We have uh, an English subtitled one, a French subtitled one, and a Spanish subtitled one. So many of you may have seen it. Now we come to our exhibitions here, our past exhibitions actually. So the first exhibition actually we had, uh, like I said, was the Jerusalem exhibition, Jerusalem Lives. Tahiyya al-Quds, okay, which was guest curated by Rim Fadda, and uh, you can see at the bottom of it, and this was a political view at Jerusalem now as a laboratory, failed laboratory for uh, globalization. There were artworks, but there were also many uh, documentary and uh, archaeological material. On top, uh, we have the continuation or the second version of the embroidery exhibition I mentioned to you, this time it was curated, uh, uh, I mean, it was shown in Ramallah, in Birzeit, but uh, um, we expanded it and we changed the title. And again, same uh, curator, guest curator, Rachel Dedman. And this, I think it's very important to understand that we invested a lot in this exhibition, not only to bring it about, but also to do the, you know, the virtual reality that I mentioned, because this is a completely different look at costume. We're not looking at costume through heritage or fashion. We're looking at it through a materialist 
social history approach. But نرجع شوي لورا لأنه في صورة ما حكيتش عنها هاي. So then we have the the last exhibition we had, uh, guest curated by Dr. Tina Sherwell. This was our first all art exhibition. And probably the last for a while. So this was called Intimate Terrains, and it was a it, it was a look at, at representations of landscape in uh, Palestinian art, and it's the largest exhibition of Palestinian art ever held. We had 36 artists from different generations. Uh, some of the work that we are very proud to do at the museum. I mean, if it's if we do nothing, this is like the, the most beautiful thing we do, is our education uh, program. Uh, so every program we do, whether it's the websites or the, the collection or the environmental uh, awareness work or the exhibitions, everything has an educational component. Uh, some of it takes place in Birzeit, some of it takes place outside of Birzeit. We have a partnership with the Ministry of uh, uh, Education and we bring in uh, hundred schools, governmental schools, UNRWA, UN, UN refugee schools. Uh, we also produce all these magnificent publications, kids trails, teacher training guide, uh, coloring books for children. It's just an amazing program. And I have to say that all this is designed and conceptualized in-house by my colleague, Hannah, Hannah Rashid, and my other colleague, Sara Zahran, whom I salute. And it's all done, conceptualized, designed, created in-house. And we're very proud of that. Okay, this is a new program uh, that uh, I'm very proud to have launched last year uh, as part of the development of a new uh, program strategy for the museum. Actually, it was the first five-year program strategy of the museum and it was the introduction of a knowledge and research component with a new research and knowledge department. So that means that the, the museum not only produces activities, actually the, the mission of the museum is to produce and disseminate learning experiences about Palestine, emancipatory learning experiences. That means also knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. So here in the top half of the image, we have the open call for papers, which is still open, CFP. Uh, this is the largest ever uh, call for papers and grants that are given uh, on the subject of Palestinian culture. So we are talking about um, call for papers, publications, conference, and in it, there is a marvelous project, which is a two year long project of mapping knowledge gaps in Palestinian art history. So this is all, and this is generously supported by Omar and Ghalia Qattan. And uh, so this is the call for papers, which are still open until mid-May. So I urge any researcher and academic who dreamt of doing some research on Palestinian culture, this is your chance. At the bottom, we have some of our events that, you know, we have talks and symposia, and it's all original. We try always as much as we can to commission original research, except for the picture at the bottom. Of course, this is Dr. Leila Abu Lughod giving a lecture. At the left was our first symposium, our first, hopefully, annual symposium that we organize on the theme of landscape. Uh, Doctora, maybe I'll just ask you a quick question here. The call for papers, is it only open for scholars or can anyone with an in-depth interest in Palestine contribute? Yani, shuf, ihna, we are asking also for primary material and primary research and archival research and even testimonies because we're map, uh, ha, sorry, and I'm talking about the history of art call. For the rest, uh, no, it should be scholarly because because we have open calls for artists, but if it's primary information, primary material, yes, it would fit in un under this rubric. Yes. Thank you. And, and this one, on, this gentleman at the, the bottom right here is uh, Umar Qattan, who's the chairman of the museum, I think. Okay. Former, former chef. Uh, former he, chairman. I think I think he's the founding uh, chairman of the okay. of the museum board, and and we are very grateful to him. Uh, so this is, of course, the, the this is, uh, of course, the regular work that we do, uh, which is what we call the public program. So we have open days, we have agricultural events, we have a, um, you know, concerts down, uh, you know, at the bottom, as you can see in our amphitheater, we have an open air amphitheater. We do a lot of workshops for designers, for artists. For example, here you see artist uh, Amir Shomali giving a workshop on designing uh, political posters, uh, conceptualizing rather. Um, we have an astronomy event. I mean, the 
the museum is a place for all segments of society and all age groups. So anybody can find something they want or, or, or something they can appreciate or that can entertain them or that they can learn in the uh, museum. Okay, so this is the campaign that we launched right before COVID uh, or right before the confinement. You know, every museum in the world launched the same hashtag, museum from home, okay? So we translated it in Arabic to Mathafak Fibetak. But we also added something else. We do have a Palestinian specificity. We're not like any museum in the world. So this is why we call the campaign Palestine Perseveres. So, we were very lucky because the museum was conceived as a transnational museum. Everything that we did physically was already online on our YouTube channel or on our social media. Plus two of our major programs are already online, the PAL archives and the PAL journeys and the 360 tour. Basically, we, we were able to turn on a dime very quickly and to redesign this, uh, our content for a stay at home audience. But the, the nice thing that we did is that we added um, competitions, uh, activities uh, to do at home. And also we developed um, instructional videos for activities that people do can do at home as if their home was a museum. Hence we reversed the thing. And I'm very happy to, to say that um, this has increased dramatically our, you, you know, our followers on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, dramatically increased. And I'm very, very happy and proud to say that uh, ICOM, the International Council of Museums, uh, mentioned our campaign and mentioned our work today in an article they published about museums and COVID. So I hope you can join us too and follow our hashtags and participate in our campaign. So this is our staff, our wonderful staff, my colleagues, and uh, in the back of the building. Actually, I was telling you about the garden being, uh, you know, o o completely fully flowering and so on, except in this area. This is the area where we have a work by Bob uh, Gramsma on the, on the right, and he actually, it's called Facts on the Ground. You know what Facts on the Ground means in the Palestinian context. So he excavated the bottom, of this cement tongue to show the fragility of the facts on the ground. And so we had to leave everything naked outside it. But the rest are all, you know, regular stone from the building. Um, from Victoria, the before we proceed uh, with the Fakhr Nissa's presentation, which is going to be uh, all too short, at least uh, uh, for, my, uh, for my sake, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Uh, the, the, uh, the first question is, do you accept donations by, uh, by Palestinians and maybe even non-Palestinians? I am not talking about financial donations, but maybe items, uh, um, clothes, even historical documents, photographs. Should someone, if someone finds an album of their grandparents' photographs, should they throw them away or should they give them to the museum? And why? No, they should contact the museum. First, this is why we did these videos to train people how to, how to archive material that they have at home. Definitely, we need, uh, we need uh, donations of uh, uh, items of Palestinian uh, material culture, and we welcome people to get in touch with them. We have uh, top staff uh, who have received the best training, the best museums in the world and who have years of experience behind them in renovating and in restoring uh, paper documents and clothes and so on. So that's not an uh, issue. This is what the museum is, is for. It's to receive these donations of items. Um, do we have any idea of numbers of visitors or do you count uh, children, workshops? Is there any sort of uh, key performance indicators uh, as, the, as, the, as some Western consultants call them? No, 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 it's not Western consultants. <laughs> let me let you in on a secret. Everybody at the Palestinian Museum has their own KPI, from the director to the managers, to the officers, to the coordinators, everybody has a KPI and everybody follows them religiously. Anyway, let's close that parenthesis. So <laughs> let me tell you that uh, last year we had about 25,000 visitors, uh, not only in Palestine, in, I mean, in, on the building, but also at events that we held outside, whether it was in uh, Beirut or in Jordan or 
in Haifa, you know, so yeah. And uh, we hope to have more, but I think it's a pretty good number, you know. Um, okay, so before we move on to Fakhranissa segment, uh, Louisa McMillan says, beautiful background behind you, Dr. Adela. What is that artwork behind you? No, it's not an artwork. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Mexican uh, fabric. Uh, it's called Otomi. No. Yes, thank you. I thought you were going to ask me about the museum. <laughs> I will, I will. So what I want to do is uh, with your... Um, uh, with Actually, your before we move on, I... Yeah. I don't know if I should say something about uh, PAL journeys. Uh, sure, tell us, tell us anything. Yeah, like, no, you, uh, know, you know, the world has, uh, you know, this museum has been in gestation since 1997. It mm -hmm. was the brainchild of Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Abu Lughod, you know, who was uh, dear friends with uh, uh, Edward Said. It was supposed to, to, okay, let's say 1997, Palestine and the world were in a very specific place with very specific expectations. And today in 2020, the world is a very different place. Um, however, the Palestinian cause and the Palestinian question is the same. Uh, its uh, justification is the same. And uh, I think people have a lot to learn from what Palestinians have managed to achieve despite all of the odds, I think it's a marvelous question of survival and mm -hmm. steadfastness for a people that has managed to survive without resources, only with the strength of uh, hard work and education and belief in their cause. So I think if uh, people um, you know, are afraid of labels, Palestinian, Pal Journeys, Pal Archive, what's that, Palestinian Museum, this is how we should look at it, and this is what the museum is about. You know, prevent uh, providing all these narratives of steadfastness and of humanity. Uh, Doctora, I actually have a question from a former student of mine at uh, Yale University, uh, Selma Shaheen from Palestine, uh, asks, says, thank you for an amazing talk, Doctora. I have been to the museum and it is incredible there. I had a quick question. Do you have initiatives or are you planning on starting new ones to keep Palestinian students involved and connected to their culture? We actually, thank you, in the strategy that uh, I mentioned I developed last year, we, uh, the, the new five-year strategy of the museum, we do exactly have such an initiative, which I don't want to go into details, but I think you and I understand each other. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you meaning Selma, and I understand each other. And I hope that uh, we will be able to bring it about because now, you know, we are, يعني, we have to get out of, uh, as we say in Arabic, from the, the neck of the bottle, from the bottleneck. There you go, in English. With the corona, we don't know what the, what the financial consequ uh, consequences are going to be, but we are steadfast in our belief that we can implement our strategy and our plan. So you should uh, hook up with us, Selma, and maybe we can implement our plan next year or, or, or the year after. Let's take a couple more questions and then we can move on. Uh, one question from Farah. Uh, Farah says, are there any restrictions presented to the museum and its project by governmental cultural policies. Do you have any restrictions that you operate under? Well, we're under occupation. Okay. Uh, I should say something about the museum. The museum is a non-governmental organization. Uh, we, uh, the museum is the flagship uh, project of the Welfare Foundation, Mu'assisat al-Ta'awun, which many of you may be familiar with. It's the largest Palestinian charitable philanthropic development organization, which was established in 1983 uh, by a number of Palestinian philanthropists and uh, uh, academics, among them Edward Said. And uh, the organization has developed and morphed and evolved over the years. And their flagship project, as I said, is the museum. So uh, we are registered, uh, of course, as an NGO, but that is our affiliation. We are also uh, are very happy and pleased to border the University of Birzeit that you can see on the right of the picture. And uh, we um, actually, the, our land is their land, is leased land from the University of Birzeit. And we love to have them as neighbors because their students are all the time on our terrace, in our cafeteria, in our museum, in our shop. And uh, practically all of our um, staff are graduates or students from uh, Birzeit. And we cooperate a lot with their academic centers, with their students, with their professors. 
دكتورة I have such great questions from a student called Juman Al Qawasmi, Watan Studio. She studies at Northwestern. Uh, she says that she loves the way that the museum sees itself as a mothership. She asked several question, questions, but the one I will maybe uh, present to you now is what are the next steps for the museum, especially in light of COVID? Uh, and do you have a second part of a building going forward? Yes, we do have a second part of a building going forward, but I would say like uh, any, any good museum director worth their, their salt, our goal is to, is to close our budget deficit and to be able you know, to run the ship uh, soundly. But anyway, but the point is that we are continuing to work. We are continuing with our plans, uh, even during the five week confinement that we had. Everybody worked very hard from home, thanks to the miracles of technology. Basically what we did is that our programs are the same. They just have been postponed. We are waiting to see what will happen with our partners at the schools and the Ministry of Education to see how we can try transform our education program, but it's all systems go as far as we're concerned and our programs and strategy are going ahead as planned, uh, except that the calendar will be shifting. Uh, so it means more exhibitions, more online platforms, more archiving of Palestinian history, uh, more uh, production of knowledge and exciting publications and encounters. So uh, yeah. We're I want to ask you a couple of more questions, but if you keep your answers very, very brief. So under, under 20, 30 seconds, is that okay? okay. So uh, Maura, Maura James uh, from Harvard uh, says, uh, she's thanking you for your presentation. She says, do you have any plans to partner with other museums, whether they were Palestinian or non-Palestinians uh, abroad? Yes, of course. I mean, that's what we want to do. That's our DNA. We have uh, all our exhibitions are, uh, uh, you, you know, are ready to, to travel. We have touring documents, we have touring uh, specifications. Um, I was very happy to be in Japan in September to participate at the ICOM conference in Kyoto. And I met, uh, I spent my days basically having meetings with uh, museum directors and uh, to tell them about how they can, uh, how they can welcome our exciting uh, and beautiful exhibitions. Uh, so yes, we do want to do that very much. And we are actually working with some museums on uh, bringing that about, but you know, the work of museums is very long. Uh, the planning period is long. So when we say that we're planning a traveling exhibition, it doesn't happen in six months. It happens in a year, in a year and a half. So, Victoria, I have, I think there's a, a slight objection. Sorry, that was long. No, it's okay, it's okay. But this will be the last question about the Palestinian Museum. I will then share with you for the For now, chat. for now. Yes, yes, until we, until we come back to it later in the next half hour. Uh, there's, a, there's a comment here, I think, from uh, Yara Masri, who says, um, I noticed in PAL journeys that a painting by Antoine Jean Gros, uh, Napoleon in Jaffa, is used. Uh, can we have another choice of that era uh, of a representative painting, uh, particularly as it was commissioned as French nationalist propaganda in the Orient? Yes, so. but if we put that document, it's for a purpose because we are putting the, the document, the, that painting as a document of, uh, of colonial domi domination or conquest, and we are providing the Palestinian perspective on it. So this is why the document is there. Okay. The document is not there to illustrate the Palestinian narrative. It's the Palestinian narrative is in, in a way illustrating the, the, the hidden, narrative provided by that painting or eclipsed by that painting. Uh, Doctora, now we will be moving to the second half of this, uh, this presentation. I apologize that you are rushed and I really thank you for being so patient with us. Uh, please take this chance and have a sip of water because I feel like you have given us so much knowledge. Um, I think a few people uh, I know or few people uh, are able to uh, give us such a, uh, a, an in-depth uh, account of uh, the upcoming artist. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have a, a one of her students here as well amongst our uh, attendees tonight. But the artist that uh, Dr. Adila will be speaking about is a, a Turkish-born artist that we like to claim also in the Arab world. Yes, she was Turkish, but I think she also spent so many years in two uh, Arab countries, Iraq uh, and Jordan. And there's so much to say. I cannot emphasize that. Uh, Dr. Adila once attempted to give a talk in one hour, and the talk lasted for an hour and a half. And apparently, they had to 
shut down the lights and ask people to leave because it was so interesting, but it kept going on. And I think that is just an example of how much knowledge she has, but also uh, how important this topic is. And so, uh, Doctor, I don't know how you will do it, but you will be telling us in the next 10, 10 minutes or so, I know I said 17 minutes, but I just cut them down by a few minutes. In the next 10 minutes or so, tell us about your personal journey with this book. So I know people can go read about this artist, but tell us about your personal journey. What made you write this book that's now critically acclaimed, it's published in more than one language, uh, so you have you have 10 minutes. Uh, right. to so I just want to say something exactly like Sultan said. I mean, this topic, uh, I could and I should talk about it for hours. And so my editor is going to be Sultan. Sultan is going to tell me what to say about Fakhr Nisa because otherwise it's never going to end. So what was the question? What's First my connection? Question. Okay. What need so, you like this book? Aywa. So... The short answer and the quick answer is that when I found out that there was going to be a Fakhr Nisa Zaid retrospective at Tate Modern, I thought that this would be the best, the most appropriate time for me to find a publisher who would take this book or the idea of the book. There was no book, there was no research. And uh, so that's the short answer. Is that short enough for you? That, that's fine. Sure, we can continue. <laughs> so, so the book was published in English as well as in Turkish. Um, do we, we published have... it. We published it at Art Books Publishing in uh, 2017, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it uh, it came out the following year uh, in Turkish. Uh, it was published by our friends Derem Art who are also the gallery of the estate in Istanbul. And I say hi to all the ladies in the gallery and to Hazar, if he's watching. Uh, and so, but I, I thank my publisher, Andrew, really for believing in this book because I, I told him, this is the book that I want to write about this lady who used to be my uh, art teacher back, I don't want to say how many decades ago. He said, okay, show me, you know, a book. I said, I don't have anything. Uh, show me an abstract, show me, I said, I have nothing. I'm still gonna do the research. And he believed in it. He, he didn't know me from Adam and uh, it was a, a journey. So I, yeah. And I thank also AFAC, the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture for funding me. So now we begin. Doctora, uh, you had some kind of uh, personal association, uh, but also I think uh, members of your family also knew the artist, is that correct? Right, so and now we begin with the long answer. After giving the short answer, now we begin with the long answer. So uh, my uh, family, my parents were living in Jordan in the late 70s and the mid, until the mid, mid 80s. My mother, Aisha Lamseen, Aisha Lamseen is a novelist and a writer. She happened to meet Fakhri Nisa, Princess Fakhri Nisa Zaid, and uh, they became friends. But uh, most important, so this picture was in 1979, May 1979, I think May 22nd. And Fakhrenissa was still working uh, on that painting. It was not finished. This is in her studio. And I think this was the first time my mother met her. And anyway, so the point is, okay, they became friends. But most importantly, they had the project of writing a book that my mother, uh, after she became friends with Fakhrenissa and she learned about her life, uh, she, they had the project that my mother would write a book about her. It, it would be her life story. And uh, my mother is a novelist, not, not an art writer or a critic. And she had published a very successful best-selling novel in 1976 in Paris. So uh, anyway, four reasons having to do with the publishing world at that time. The book did not happen. But Malish, uh, let's go back. <laughs> Thank you. But they stayed friends. And at that time, you know, like all adolescents, I had delusions that maybe I wanted to become an artist. So my mother asked Fakhri Nisa if she could give me painting lessons because she used to give painting, real painting lessons to a group of wonderful and talented people. Among them, I'm happy to see uh, our dear and beloved Femia here. And so Fakhri Nisa agreed, but of course I could not come in the morning and take part in the real classes in the morning because I was at school. So I would come every Wednesday afternoon. I, I did that for about two years, except during the school uh, holidays. Uh, so that is my personal connection 
actual connection with Fakhr al-Nisa. This lady on the right of the photo is not you. Akid la. <laughs> okay, I was checking. Doctora, uh, tell us, tell us about, uh, about her personality. How, what was the personality of uh, Fakhr Nisa? Very strong, very powerful, very mercurial, mer mercurial, uh, generous, expansive, just like her paintings. Kind, generous, determined, fiery, uh, what you saw is what you got. There was nothing hidden. She was Victoria, amazing. Victoria, so you see this for everybody, just uh, make sure you take a look at this work because the next image is actually quite similar. So we, we find ourselves uh, uh, transported decades ahead uh, with the same image and almost you're standing in the same position almost that your mother was standing at, so correct? Thank you, Sultan. Thank you for doing this. It's really very moving to me. Wallahi, I never noticed the similarity until yesterday when we were uh, preparing. So yeah, and subhanAllah, it's very moving. Um, so yes, so this was uh, in 2018 when uh, my book came out in Turkish, uh, uh, translated, and there was the opening of an exhibition called Ode to Passion at Durham Art. So uh, it, was a, it, it was a very smart idea to have for an exhibition because they gathered works, not for sale, but from Turkish collectors for the first time. And that this work was shipped from Amman because it's in the estate. And so they, as they said, hey, why don't you take a group picture because your book just came out with, we have here uh, His Royal Highness Prince Ra bin Zaid, the son of uh, uh, Fakhr Nisa and Princess Majida uh, Raid, uh, his wife, and uh, who both uh, were enormously helpful and enormously supportive when I did my research and welcoming me into their home and opening everything uh, to me. So I thank them for their kindness and uh, faith. Uh, really, without them, this would not have happened. Doctora, uh, how long did it take you to write the book and what, how was the access to the archive? So uh, was the access uh, available? Were the documents in Turkish? W were they in Arabic? What, what kind of challenges did you face with accessing the archive to write this important story? Uh, okay, actually, I should, you know, because we're doing this on Zoom, very often I will ask myself when I was doing the research, nobody would be able to do the work that I'm doing 20 years from now, because Fakhr Nisa was a child of the 19th century, of European high culture from the 19th century. So this means that she had certain tastes in music and so on, and in art and in literature, but in her personal habits, she kept a diary and she wrote everything. And the amazing gift for me as a, as, as a, as a researcher at that time was that before writing a letter, she would write a, a draft on her diary. And so I found these drafts of these amazing letters. So the, no, the challenge was that because Fakhr Nisa wrote everything and documented everything. I mean, people nowadays would write notes on a computer or take a selfie. No, she would sketch and, and write on the same, on, on the same um, notebook, okay? So the notebook was the mirror of her life and there are tens of notebooks. What helped me enormously is that I would say 90% of all this was written in French. And uh, because uh, she, it, okay, F French was not her native language, but uh, it was the language of her education and it was the language that she loved. So everything was written in French. For the later years, she started writing in English. Uh, the, the Turkish material was only the private correspondence with her family, but there was even correspondence with her family in French. So for me, it was very easy. Her handwriting, I was already used to it from before. So it was just a question of sifting through it and to answer your question, uh, I think it, it took me, it took me a year, I think, or less than a year between the research, the research on site, and then the writing, and then the, and then the bibliographical and the historical and the analysis research. It took me about a year, which is crazy, but I dedicated myself to it, and I, had, I was lucky to have a uh, grant from AFAC to allow me to do this. We have a uh, journalist, uh, Melissa Gronland, who says, bravo, Dr. Adila, it's no mean feat to maintain your persistence and with, with a beautiful uh, result. Uh, Doctora, do you, do you recommend that other people uh, uh, pursue a, a book project and document 
histories of art in the Middle East and in the Arab world? This is a must. This is an absolute must. But uh, it also helps if you have an artist who is an interesting person, uh, who had an interesting life, and who was an interesting person. So mm -hmm. it, it, it helps. Because then if the artist is not in interesting, you can just write a, a, uh, a monograph. Mm -hmm. My book here was an artist biography, meaning I, I reconstructed her career completely. I reanalyzed her her career and the artworks but i also talked about her life the reviews that she got so it's a real artist biography for that you need to have the support of the families or the support of the artist that's not an easy task uh, doctora uh, i just want to uh, tell everybody notice uh, doctora actually pointed this out to me uh, the right side of this painting is uh, uh, actually had to be uh, turned is this correct uh, because it was such a huge uh, artwork that she, it wouldn't fit into uh, one room. Uh, Doctora, uh, thank you for pointing out that we had one of her students here. Uh, would you allow me to ask Sit uh, Ofemiaris uh, to say a couple of words? Is that is that is that allowed? May I? It's your show. Sit Ofemia, thank you for joining us from Canada. You were one of Fakhranissa um, Zaid's students uh, in in Amman. Uh, could you maybe take a minute and tell us a little bit about your impressions? And I'd love to host you for a longer uh, one hour talk, but maybe just a, a few seconds, uh, under a minute, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sultan, for opening the microphone. And thank you, Adila, for such a wonderful presentation. I don't think anyone could ever do a better uh, job than what Adila did. Thank you, Adila. Thank you, Sultan. Well, Fahrin uh, to me, I was one of the very lucky few to be chosen by her, and I was one of her very first students from 1976. And uh, what can I say about her? You know, there, uh, there was this very famous uh, uh, lady, Katya Granov, who was the, the, the dean of art in Paris. Then she, she, she resumed Fakhrenissa in the best four words with Setun. C'est une messagère de millénaire empire. She's the, I mean, it's, that's the, I think the best to put in few words. And what I learned from her, you know, she's not, she's not a school. It's not like an, a regular institute. It's a school in life. It's, uh, I mean, she was a whole, uh, she was a giant at her time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the most important lesson was you must forget what you know that's what she taught us at the very beginning. Because what you know is what you have learned, but what you don't know is what you really are. And this is, and this is the cosmic forces that are within you. That's why you don't see nature with the, the nature with the, you have to see nature in your inner eyes to be able to create the mystery, to discover, to penetrate the mysteries of the universe. I think, and, uh, it would take days to talk about her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sit uh, Ufemia. Sit Adila, tell us maybe about one or two of the works here. Which, which work would you like to talk about? Well, yeah. obviously, I can talk about all of them. But let's, let's go back to the black and white one. Uh, uh, that uh, one is called Towards a Sky. Uh -huh. And it reappeared miraculously also in 2017. Sotheby's found it and sold it. And it's in a very distinguished collection now. But this is actually when it was exhibited in 1956 at the Palais de Tokyo, the current Palais de Tokyo, uh, where they had the uh, uh, periodical uh, Salon de Realité Nouvelle, where Fakhrenissa participated with all the big artists of the day. So here, this is 592 centimeters long. And uh, so it's called Towards a Sky, Vers un Ciel. And, uh, when she showed it at the, te uh, at the, at the ICA in 56, uh, it could not fit and they had to roll it. Uh, they had to roll it down and uh, uh, to li like, you know, make it a little bit uh, slighter. And then when she showed it at the Lord's Gallery uh, later again, uh, it couldn't fit in the gallery. They had to just put it outside. This is not an exceptional work. This was a regular output by Fakhranissa. And if you want, we can talk about it, about this kind of work later. 
So um, we can continue. You can continue speaking, and I'm just scrolling through the uh, the images. Um, I mean, I don't know if I should talk about the paintings or if I should talk about Fakhr as an as an artist. I mean, all these paintings are, uh, you know, are mentioned in my book and, and analyzed very well. Uh, but I would like to talk more about her as an as an artist. But this is a this is a wonderful painting that surfaced, I think, last year. And I was so happy it, it came and I wrote about it in my Instagram. And I thought this work illustrates a key period in Fakhr uh, life and career right before the break that she suffered in 1958. And I can't believe it's out. And if anybody can buy it, grab it. And lo and behold, I found out a year later that our friend here has bought it and was lucky enough to buy it. And it can be seen by everybody, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, I was telling Dr. Adil when we were doing this presentation that I, I feel terrible about adding a work from the collection because this is not a Barjil majlis. This is a majlis for everybody. Uh, but it was, it was just a funny coincidence that Dr. Adil had posted about this work a month before we bought it without my knowing. I had no idea, I promise. And then I was so happy to see it on your, on your, on your account. And, uh, and I think this is obviously a, a time just to, to, to thank all these auction houses that have been doing a, a great job in the past uh, decade and a half, uh, documenting a lot of the uh, artworks, bringing them back, making them available in high resolution images, uh, text. So all these things I think are important to acknowledge, uh, not only auction houses, but a lot of galleries uh, and scholars like yourself, Dr. Adila, if it wasn't for them, then many of these works would be, uh, would be uh, lost. Um, I actually have a, an image here. Uh, Doctora, what is the strange thing that we are seeing in front of us? I see bones. How is this an artwork? What's going on here? This is a great artwork by Fakhr Nisa, which is in the Huma Kabakji collection now, which is an excellent collection in Turkey, private collection. So, I mean, th this is a long story. Where to start? Because we haven't spoken yet about Fakhr Nisa as an artist. This is one period in her life where she was experimenting with uh, poultry, uh, chicken, uh, rabbit bones, and she did a lot of things with them, which ended up in, in some point. But here, this is a transitional period. First, she started with the bones, she colored them, then she put them, and this is what we see here, she put them on a canvas, and then she transitioned out of that by encasing them in polyester resin, by inventing basically a new art form, a new art medium that she called Paleo Cristalos, and I think that's the next picture. So sometimes she would, this one doesn't have a name, that one doesn't have a name, but I have some of, uh, I have some in my book that, uh, that are, where the bones are assembled differently, which are called uh, uh, adores of the sun and so on. You know, it's important to understand that there was a lot of trauma turmoil, and I would say heaviness in Fakhr Nissa's life. And like I write in the preface of my book, what saved her, okay, it is the art, but also she had this sense of playfulness that I call whimsy, that she could see interesting things in the smallest things, that she had this childhood, childlike gaze with her impeccable intellect and her modernist temperament, which made her do you know, the, the bones thing. And this is the culmination of that uh, bones-based artwork, which she called Paleo Cristalos. Uh, and uh, here we see that she basically, I mean, I described the whole technical uh, thing. Uh, it's a slab of polyester, but here we see all slabs are broken. The blue ones, she put them inside the yellow ones with, of course, the bones, the animal bones. But what she did in her house in Paris before she moved, because, I, you know, as I write in my preface, she was a painter of motion and light. OK, so she uh, had these filters that uh, these, I'm sorry, light projectors that would move on a motor, rotate and would project the light behind the Paleo Cristalos. I mean, 
for anybody seeing it now, you can say, it's fine, it's a work of art, it's, um, it's amazing as it is. But no, even that was not enough for Fakhr Nisa. She would put the light projector behind it, and so you would have the light projecting from behind the Paleo Cristalos, projecting on the wall. I mean, you can just imagine the effect. But this is, this is the projection of the interior world of Fakhr Nisa that she projected onto her artwork externally. Um, I think this is the penultimate image here that we have. Uh, this is an image from 1968. And so um, this was actually an interesting year that you told me about. She was, a, she was about to have a major exhibition in, in, 19, in, the, in the 60s. And then obviously the events in Paris, 1968, had taken place. Um, what, are, what, are the written, what are the unwritten histories of Fakhr Nisa Zaid? The thing that happened when you know when you analyze the history of the of the period that she was okay she I'll just talk about Paris when she was in Paris she was part of a group of loose group called the Nouvelle École de Paris actually she, she was part of the, their first exhibition in 1952 in the Galerie Babylon in La Rue Babylon so um, by the by the early 60s the world had moved on you had something called Les Nouveaux Réalistes and so on. And her colleagues were starting to get rest re retrospectives in the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris. They were beginning to represent France at the Venice Biennale. Fakhr Nissa had no country to represent at the Venice Biennale and no country to give her a major, you know, uh, museum. She was a refugee, basically. She was a refugee living in exile, in obscurity in the 60s. And what happened is that she met André Malraux. André Malraux had heard of her. He asked her to, okay, André Malraux was the, was a companion of Charles de Gaulle. He was the minister, the first minister of culture of uh, France. And basically he is, André Malraux is the blueprint for all subsequent uh, personas, let's say, of culture ministers around the world. So he knew who she was. He asked her to come and visit him in, uh, in his office in Rue de Valois. And she took with him those bones that she had painted. Mm -hmm. And because she wanted to show him something new, she's not going to bring, you know, her Apple computer to show her, her works. So she said, this is nothing, ce sont des joujoux, these are just little toys. He said, yes, maybe they are toys, mais c'est de l'art, this is art. And they agreed to have an exhibition. And for, this, and for the following years, I found this amazing thing in the, in the documents. She was in correspondence for years for, with the legendary Jacques Jojard. For people who know the French history, Jacques Jojard was the keeper of the Louvre Museum during the Nazi occupation, okay? And then he ended up working in the French Ministry of Culture in charge of exhibitions. So he was visiting with Fakhr Nissa and exchanging, and she was sending him lists, detailed lists of paintings and measurements to exhibit in that exhibition. And May 68 happened, and Jojard was let go by André Malraux, and then André Malraux was let go, or, or the whole government changed. And so that, that uh, major retrospective exhibition did not happen, but it's okay because what we got from that is all the Paleo Cristalos that Fakhr Nissa produced because she thought she was going to show in that exhibition, including the new portraiture, the exceptional portraiture that she produced in the 60s, which was a continuation of her abstract work. I mean, if you remove the eyes and you look at the, at, at the skin, uh, Doctora, uh, I have uh, four questions for four minutes. So every question must be uh, within one minute. So the first question I will ask is actually from uh, uh, Georgetown University student Alia Kawar, who says, uh, how appreciated uh, and recognized was Fakhr Nisa Zaid when she was living in Jordan as an abstract artist? Oh, she was. I mean, everybody who knew who Fakhr Nisa was, she had the big exhibition in 1981. That exhibition where, where uh, uh, Femia exhibited, and even I had uh, had two works, you know, exhibited there, it was a giant monster exhibition. There was no gallery that held it. It was held in the Cultural Palace, and it helped normalize uh, abstract art in Jordan, because at that time, there were still the issues of, you know, the dichotomies of Torah, where Hadath, and engaged art, and committed art, and then she came with this blast, you know, of abstract art. Uh, three minutes, three questions. Does Fakhr Nisa deserve her own museum? For sure. 
for sure she deserves her own museum. Look, Fakhra Nissa was a force of modernism. She's the most important modern artist that you probably never heard of. She was part of the Turkish avant-garde in the uh, late 40s. She was of the European Parisian avant-garde in, in the 50s in Paris. She was the first woman of any uh, country to exhibit at the ICA. The ICA was, if you will, the Tate of its time. Um, she uh, managed to uh, reinvent herself by, you know, changing her uh, work every 10 years, inventing this new art form of uh, Paleo Cristalos, then reinventing herself as a teacher. But, you know, people can console themselves by going to the Istanbul Modern. The Istanbul Modern now it's in, it's in renovation, but hopefully when they uh, reopen, they have some amazing works. And uh, inshallah, in the future, there will be more uh, well curated exhibitions about her work. Doctora, uh, last two questions. Uh, apparently, you found some new documents, or someone came across new documents of Fakhr Nisa. Yes, uh, I'm very thankful for the family who were very kind to find a treasure trove of documents. And I went and I looked at them. I have not been able to research them yet because of what we talked about in the first half takes all my time. But uh, this was actually a very interesting cache of documents because it touches upon what I try to do in my book, which is to resitu resituate Fakhran Nissa in the art world of uh, Europe and of the US at that period. So it was correspondence with gallerists and with artists and so on. So inshallah, I will have time to, uh, to sit through them and then to produce a new paper. Thank you, Sultan, for bringing this up. Victoria, uh, my final question uh, is, where can, we where can we buy your book? You can buy my book on Amazon, of course, both Amazon UK and Amazon.com. And uh, you can also buy it directly from my publisher, Art Publishing. Uh, Victoria, before I end uh, the chat, I just, I was scrolling through the 150, Sorry, 100, ah, sorry. sorry. The, the publisher is called Art Books. But the website is art publishing. Yes. Right. Uh, before I end the talk, I was scrolling over uh, some of the guests, and one of the guests is wearing a Palesti Palestinian museum uh, T-shirt. Uh, let me try and find him here so I can spotlight him. Where are you? Hold on a second. Okay. Oh, there you go. There he is. Uh, I'll spotlight him for a second. Uh, Rami, uh, Rami ah! can, you, can you show us your T-shirt? Can you lift your T-shirt? There you go. Matahab al There you Hi, go. Hi, Rami. <laughs> Good to see you. Hey. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Doctora. I really, um, I really appreciate uh, uh, this, this time that you've given us. Uh, thank you so much. As I said, it's impossible, nearly impossible, to, uh, to fit within one hour all the knowledge that Dr. Adela has. The great news is that there's so many more resources. If you care about either of the subjects, Dr. Adela has published a book on each one of them. So, uh, and also there's videos, there's, uh, she's on Monte Carlo, she's on YouTube, she's on uh, uh, all, uh, all manners of, uh, um, of intellectual output she has produced. So please uh, make sure that you buy the book and uh, all Palestinians and non-Palestinians, all Arabs, all Middle Easterners, document your past, uh, take a lesson, learn a lesson from Dr. Adela. Thank you all for joining us and have a nice day. Thank you. And follow the Palestinian Museum. Thank you, Sultan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us.